All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to the joint ACOM RAL seminar. I'm pleased, pleased to introduce our today's speaker, Wen Fu Tang, who is no less than a superhuman, if you look at her CV. Um, she grew up in China. Um, she did her BS from Nanjing University. Um, and then she moved to University of Arizona in 2016 for her MS and then later her PhD. She finished her PhD in 2019 and then came to NCAR as an ASP postdoctoral fellow. And because she's a superhuman, she decided to stay at NCAR and is now a project scientist uh, in the ACOM laboratory. Um, she does very exciting research in the areas of wildfire, its emissions, and impacts on air quality. But she's also an expert in chemical data simulation and many other things. She's also the lead for UCAR Africa initiative. Um, she's already serving as a co-I, PI on more than seven or eight proposals that are active right now. So you can see why I called her a superhuman. She has more than 25 papers, many more conference papers. I can go on and on about her achievements, but today is her day to talk about her research. So over to you, Wenfu. Thank you, Rajesh, for the super nice uh, introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Wen Fu Tang from ACOM. Uh, before I start my presentation, I want to thank Chris uh, from Rao who inviting me to this um, uh, to give this seminar, and I really appreciate this opportunity. And uh, I do hope to uh, build uh, connections and uh, uh, collaborations with folks at Rao. Uh, and I also want to thank Qing and Kyle for making this uh, a uh, Rao ACOM joint seminar so that I can share my recent updates with my colleagues at ACOM. So uh, we will talk about fires, fire emissions, and uh, fire impacts on air quality today. Um, I know there are many fire experts uh, in this room. However, because I know um, you all have very uh, diverse background, uh, I put uh, a few slides for, the, uh, for some background information for fires. So um, the first point I want to emphasize is that fire is an interdisciplinary and cross-scale phenomenon. And there are many, many things that we still don't understand or don't fully understand with fires. Uh, if you look at this figure here, uh, it summarizes the uh, main interactions among fire and other components of the Earth system. So uh, as a key uh, part of our Earth system, it has various impacts uh, from weather and local scale to climate and global scale. So for example, regionally fire can impact uh, local weather and uh, degrade air quality. And uh, at climate scale, um, fire is a major source of trace gases and aerosols uh, that can change uh, the uh, uh, atmospheric composition and uh, uh, climate. Um, fires also interact actively with other uh, components of our Earth. Uh, for example, the uh, um, land use change, uh, land cover change, and land use uh, has a lot to do with fires. And uh, fire uh, can generate smoke and uh, uh, be even injected to stratosphere. Um, and also, uh, uh, fire can also impact uh, crossfire, uh, crossfire by black carbon snow interactions. Um, the, uh, these are just a few examples, and uh, the impacts of fires are far more than what I uh, have just mentioned here. And uh, focusing on fires and the atmospheric chemistry, uh, this figure here shows the various impacts of fire on the atmosphere. Um, as we can see, fire emit uh, greenhouse gases, aerosols, and pollutants to the atmosphere. And uh, these uh, emitted uh, chemical species, they go through various uh, chemical and uh, physical processes in the atmosphere. Uh, fire is a very important topic for air quality and public health. Now, if you look at this figure on the left, it shows the percentage of total PM 2.5 attributed to wildfire. Um, and if you look at this map uh, in 
uh, many places, uh, fire is uh, the major reason for uh, surface PM 2.5 pollution. Uh, and on the right here are just uh, a few uh, examples of the news uh, uh, reporting uh, fire impacts on air quality and uh, health. So uh, how do we study um, atmos uh, fire impacts on atmospheric chemistry? Uh, here uh, I will list a few uh, common approaches people take. So there's uh, lab experiments. Um, through lab experiments, uh, we will be able to determine the emissions from fires and the chemistry uh, of fire-emitted gases and uh, aerosols. And there's also in-situ observations that include both aircraft and ground. Uh, these uh, type of data are often used to uh, understand uh, fire emissions and uh, uh, bloom chemistry in the uh, real-world um, condition. And uh, satellite data is uh, very important uh, and very useful to detect and study fires. Uh, here is an example of uh, active fire detection from the VIRS satellite. And as, uh, as you can see, these, um, these red dots are the fire locations. And uh, you can also see the plume, uh, uh, fire smoke, which looks uh, different from the cloud here. And uh, uh, lastly, um, numer numerical modeling is a very powerful tool uh, when we want to study the interaction between fires and uh, other components of our Earth system. And uh, also it's very useful when we want to study the uh, air quality impacts of fires. Um, so uh, I will uh, talk about the uh, tools and the data I've been using in my own research before we get into any uh, um, scientific um, discussions. Um, so uh, let's start with the uh, field campaigns. Um, so as an example, I will talk about the FireXAQ field campaign. Uh, FireXAQ was conducted in the summer of 2019 it provides comprehensive observations to, uh, to investigate the impact on air quality and the climate from wildfires and also agricultural fires across the continental United States. Um, as shown by this figure here, this campaign has two parts. The first part of the campaign was based in Boise, Idaho, focusing on wildfires in the Northwest. And the second half of this field campaign was based in Salina, Kansas, um, focusing on agricultural fires and also some uh, prescribed burning. Um, this uh, data from the fire XAQ field campaign will be used uh, uh, in a, a model a study, modeling study that we will talk about later. And uh, also uh, satellite. Um, so um, satellite data are very useful in fire-related studies especially when we look at large spatial scale and also when the in situ observations are not available. Um, here I, uh, I listed four types of uh, satellite products that are relevant to fire studies. Um, there's burned area product, there's uh, active fire detection product, fire smoke plume height product, and also uh, atmospheric composition products. Um, so the atmospheric composition products are used a lot in, uh, will be mentioned a lot in this presentation. Uh, as, as we uh, mentioned um, before, fire emit various trace gases and aerosols to the atmosphere. Uh, therefore, the atmospheric composition products can be used uh, to understand uh, fire impacts on the atmospheric composition. Uh, and uh, lastly, modeling is a very important uh, component of my work. Um, and here I would like to take some time to introduce the musical model um, that will be uh, talked a, a lot in this uh, presentation. Uh, the, the full name of Musica is the Multi-Scale Infrastructure for Chemistry and Aerosol. Um, it is a new community model system developed by um, uh, ACOM at NCA and uh, together with uh, the community. 
Uh, so the advantage of uh, the musical model is um, that it enables the study of atmospheric composition and chemistry across all relevant scales. Uh, and as we mentioned before, fire is also a phenomenon uh, across uh, many, many scales, from local scale to uh, global scale. So uh, uh, we will use, uh, we will uh, talk about version zero of Musica. It's a um, global model with regional refinement. Uh, and uh, currently, Musica version zero is a configuration of the community earth system model, CESM. Um, and uh, uh, you can uh, create your own uh, model grid, but uh, this is the default model grid of Musica version zero, which has about one degree resolution globally and uh, 14 kilometer resolution over the um, um, North America. And if you are interested in uh, using this model or learning more about this model, feel free to contact me or anyone uh, on the Musica team. Okay, uh, so we've, uh, uh, we have go through uh, uh, some uh, general background and also the uh, research tools and the data I've been using um, for fire studies. Uh, from now uh, towards the end of my presentations, I will cover four topics related uh, to, to fire. And uh, uh, the first will be fire emissions. Um, now let's uh, going back to this summary figure. As we can see that um, all the stories of um, fire impact on atmospheric chemistry start with fire emissions of trace gases and aerosols. Uh, therefore, accurate estimation of fire emissions is um, well is um, extremely important, and uh, I would say it's the uh, um, the base of research on. Of fire impacts on air quality and atmospheric chemistry. Because if you don't get this part right, um, then the rest uh, processes um, will be subject to uh, uh, large uncertainties. So how does the uh, uh, fire emission look like? Uh, here I'm showing the uh, uh, time series of uh, fire emissions, uh, which is shown in blue, versus the anthropogenic emissions, uh, which is shown in orange. Um, on the left, it's a CO2, carbon dioxide, a well-known greenhouse gas. And on the right is a CO, um, carbon monoxide, and it's a well-known pollutant. So as we can see, the uh, contribution of fire emissions is relatively uh, large. It's large uh, for CO2 and it's even more significant for CO. Uh, in some uh, months, the fire emissions of CO can be even higher than the um, um, uh, anthropogenic emissions of CO. So this is another motivation to get the fire emissions right. Um, it's, uh, it's very important um, and necessary if we want to understand um, not only for air quality impact, but also the climate impact of fires. So how do we calculate fire emissions? Um, so long story short, uh, it's, um, if, uh, it's calculated by multiplying fuel consumption with the emission factors. Uh, the emission factors are often biome-specific, meaning that it is dependent on the uh, vegetation type. Uh, of course, it will be dependent on uh, some other factors, but uh, uh, so far, uh, overall, uh, most people uh, only consider the biome-specific uh, emission factors. Uh, and this uh, value uh, comes, from, uh, comes from field measurements and uh, laboratory studies. And now the question is, how do we calculate fuel consumption? Uh, the traditional way to calculate fuel consumption is through burned area. So in this approach, uh, uh, we multiply burned area with biomass loading and a uh, fraction burned. Uh, the fraction burned, uh, sometimes people call it uh, combustion completeness, but uh, uh, they are the same thing. So this is uh, one approach to calculate uh, 
emission uh, to calculate the fuel consumption. And the burned area data often um, comes from satellite. And uh, there's a, uh, the other method, which is relatively new, is through fire radiative power, FRP. Uh, FRP also comes from satellite um, products. And uh, um, for this approach, you, uh, you can multiply FRP with the biome-specific conversion factors, and you can also get um, um, fuel consumption. Um, and uh, since we are talking about fire emissions, uh, I'd like to introduce the uh, FIN inventory, the fire inventory from NCAR. Um, so it's a high-resolution, near-real-time global product uh, that provides uh, the uh, fire emissions for individual fires. And a, a, a newer version is uh, recently, uh, has recently become available through this link. And uh, um, if you want to learn more of, uh, about this product, uh, please check out this paper. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, we've talked about the how to calculate the total fire emissions, and the next thing to talk about is the uh, fire plume rise and the uh, diurnal variation of fire emissions. Um, these two are very important um, because we know the total um, among we know how to roughly estimate the total uh, fire emissions. But uh, it's also very important to know when and where these emissions uh, uh, get into the atmosphere. So that's uh, that's why we want to look at plume rise and uh, diurnal variation. Uh, these uh, two things are very important because uh, they can impact the transport, lifetime, chemistry, and also the downwind air quality effects of uh, fires. So uh, a simple way to think about this is uh, the wind speed and the wind direction can be different at different altitude of the atmosphere. And uh, if uh, the fire emissions are injected into the different altitude, it will be transported differently. Um, and also the temperature, relative humidity, and uh, other meteorology factors are also different at different altitude, and they also have a, um, a diurnal variation. So therefore, um, um, the, uh, if the fire emissions um, happen in different time of, of a day, or if it's um, at different um, altitude, the chemical reaction rate will also be different. So um, we have been, um, so in, in our CAM CAM and music CAM model, previously we've been uh, using daily uh, constant fire emissions. And uh, we also, also assume that the fire emissions are uh, released at the model surface level. Uh, we know that's um, not very appropriate. So in this study, we um, added a uh, diurnal cycle and uh, a few different plume rise schemes to the musical model and uh, um, tested uh, its impact on the air quality modeling. Um, so um, uh, this, uh, this figure on the right shows a uh, climatology of diurnal cycle of uh, PM 2.5 emissions from fire derived from satellite. And as we can see, the diurnal variation is uh, relative. Uh, well, it so um, it's, uh, it has an obvious uh, diurnal variation. And on the left, uh, this is an uh, example of plume, uh, fire plume rise. Um, so this is a photo taken uh, during the NASA Fire XAQ field campaign. And uh, the fire is uh, here on the ground, and the plume, fire plume was injected to the different levels of the atmosphere. Um, and uh, to, to, um, so we, uh, for diurnal cycle, we include uh, this um, climatology to the model. But uh, for plume rise, uh, we tested uh, four different approaches, and uh, that included uh, two climatology. Um, this, uh, this one on, uh, shown on the left is, uh, um, is uh, uh, 
the most uh, simple approach uh, which applies uh, the single profile for all file plumes. And the second approach is also a climatology, but more uh, sophisticated. Uh, in this approach, the plume rise is dependent on month, region, and vegetation. And uh, here it shows that uh, um, um, different uh, vegetation type can have a different plume profile. And we also tested uh, two parameterization approaches, and uh, that include uh, so the two parameterization approaches calculate plume rise profile for individual files based on the uh, environmental conditions and the characteristics of the file, and uh, the uh, namely is a free task scheme and a software scheme. And uh, here is an example of plume rise profiles calculated using the, uh, those four approaches. Uh, the example is for fire emissions on August 7th over the uh, Williams Flash Fire in Washington. So the Williams Flash Fire was, um, uh, uh, it, uh, was in 2019 and it was uh, sampled uh, during Fire XAQ. So, uh, so as we can see, the two parameterizations as shown in a uh, black line and a black dashed line, um, oh, sorry, uh, no, the uh, two colored line are the two parameterizations. Uh, they give a higher plume height than the two climatologies, which are shown in black uh, lines and uh, specifically for this case. Um, so we've talked about fire XAQ. Um, the flight track of the, uh, of the DC-8 aircraft during fire XAQ is shown by the red lines. Um, so uh, we use airborne observations and surface observations uh, during the fire XAQ campaign to evaluate the model results with different um, plume rise and with and without uh, um, diurnal variation. So uh, here is a, a result showing the correlation between model and uh, observations from the aircraft for CO and uh, NO2, uh, sorry, NOx. Um, so the first uh, column is uh, the control run, which is without uh, diurnal variation and uh, without plume rise. And the second one is only with plume rise. Uh, only with diurnal variation. And the, the rest of four cases are with um, uh, diurnal variation and four different, uh, uh, different uh, plume rise approaches. So um, comparing the first two cases, uh, it shows that diurnal cycle of fire emissions overall uh, alone does not improve the model agreement with airborne data. And uh, looking at the rest of four cases, um, we can see that uh, plume rise uh, um, improves model agreement with airborne data of both CO and NOx. Um, and uh, if we compare the climatology plume rise and the parameterization plume rise, um, we can see that uh, in this case, the um, parameterization plume rise performs um, better than the climatology. Um, and we also compared the model results with the uh, surface observations from EPA. Uh, shown here is uh, PM 2.5 um, and uh, uh, root mean square error, um, RMSE, which means the, the lower the value, the better. Um, and we separate northwest and, and southeast because uh, they focus on, uh, they, have, they are dominant by different types of fires. So again, if we look at the first two columns here, uh, diurnal cycle of fire emissions improve model agreement with uh, surface PM 2.5 observations. This is not the case for elbow measurements, but uh, for is the case for the um, surface observations. Um, and also um, looking at the rest of four cases, we can see that um, plume, plume rise, uh, no matter which our scheme is used, uh, 
reduce the RMSE. Um, and here, uh, we also found that adding plume rise and fire diurnal variation of emissions can change local meteorology. Um, the figure here shows an example of the, uh, still the 2019 Williams flash fire uh, during fire XAQ. And uh, each line represents uh, a different model case, and uh, uh, the model case is listed here. Um, anyway, uh, so here it shows the uh, difference of the simulation from the control run. And uh, I'm, I'm showing the temperature, uh, vertical velocity, wind speed, and also relative hum uh, humidity. So uh, the, the, um, the uh, point from this figure is that uh, plume rise and uh, diurnal variation of fire emissions can change local meteorology. Uh, and if you, you want to learn more about this um, um, study, please check out this paper. Okay. Um, so, uh, so far we've talked about fire emissions and uh, uh, plume rise and uh, diurnal variation of fire emissions. Uh, the next topic I want to talk about is um, future fire projection. Um, this study is more relevant to um, climate and is not um, very much relevant to atmospheric chemistry as the uh, previous two um, topics. Um, let's see. So, um, Um, so in this study, we use the CESM model instead of Musica. Uh, CESM is a community model for the Earth system, and uh, this uh, figure here shows the, uh, the structure of the CESM. So um, basically, CESM has uh, a few different components of the, of the Earth, like uh, atmosphere, ocean, land, uh, CS, etc. And all these components are coupled uh, with a coupler. And the Wacom is a whole atmosphere version of CSM. It has a higher top and a better representation of the stratosphere. So in this study, uh, we will use um, a Wacom um, a version of CSM. And uh, uh, See, uh, so there is a, a fire scheme in CSM, and uh, to be more specific, uh, it's in community land model, CLM. Uh, these two figures here show the structure of this uh, fire scheme. So there are four types of fires that are um, parameterized in different ways. Uh, if you look at here, so there are agricultural fires, deforestation fires, uh, pit fires and uh, the so-called uh, the other types of the fire, which is the majority of the fires in the scheme. And uh, for this uh, type of fire, um, fire occurrence and the fire spread are calculated. And uh, this uh, and uh, these two terms uh, combining together will give the burn area. Uh, and then all the fire impacts are. Um, are uh, estimated based on the burn area and also the, um, the other environment factors. And uh, so as you can see, burn area is the, the, uh, the key of this uh, scheme. So uh, using um, CSM and uh, also the, um, that fire scheme, we looked at future projections on the a few different scenarios uh, from the year 2015 to uh, 2100. Um, so uh, we looked at four SSP scenarios. SSP are the shared social economic pathways um, scenarios, and uh, SSP 1, 2.6, is the sustainable development scenario. SSP 2, 4.5, is the mid-of-the-road development scenario, and uh, 
SSP3 7.0 is a sustainable, uh, substantial land use changes scenario. And uh, lastly, SSP5 8.5 is an unmitigated baseline scenario. Um, and in addition to these SSP scenarios, we also looked at two uh, geoengineering scenarios. Uh, they are uh, G6 sulfur, uh, which, is, uh, which means we inject uh, sulfate aerosols to the stratosphere to modify the climate. And the other is a G6 solar, which uh, uh, means that we reduce the solar irradiance directly in the model. So uh, here I'm showing the future projection of global burned area under different scenarios. Um, the figure on the left shows the, uh, the future trend under SSP scenarios. Uh, and as we can see, the burned area is projected to increase under all these um, SSP scenarios by the end of this century. Um, and on the right, I'm showing the two um, geoengineering scenarios. And uh, uh, the black line is uh, also shown as the SSP 58.5 unmitigated scenario. This is the, uh, the control run of the geoengineering scenario, meaning that the geoengineering simulations are identical to the control run except uh, the, the geoengineering approach applied. And the uh, blue line here is the, uh, the targeted climate scenario. Uh, of the geoengineering. So uh, overall, um, future burn area are projected to decrease by the end of the century under the two um, geoengineering scenarios. And they are not even, uh, not only lower than the control run, but also lower than the targeted climate scenario. So uh, we've also looked at the um, the drivers of the burn area change um, under geoengineering. Um, this figure is very busy, but I don't have a better way to show this information. So the x-axis is G6 solar, uh, the correlation of delta burn area with uh, the shown variables listed here. And the y-axis is the uh, um, is the same, but for G6 sulfur, uh, the sulfate uh, geoengineering um, case. Um, and uh, so the delta burn area is calculated by burn area of geoengineering uh, scenario minus the, the um, control run. So uh, uh, here I listed a few uh, key, key points, conclusions from this, um, uh, from this um, study, they, they are mostly reflected by this figure. Uh, so geoengineering reduces wildfire occurrence by decreasing surface uh, temperature and wind speed and uh, increasing relative humidity and uh, soil water content. Uh, however, geoengineering also yields reductions in precipitation compared with a, a warming climate, which offsets some of the fire reduction. Um, in, in general, the stratospheric sulfate aerosol approach has a stronger fire reducing effect than the solar irradiance reduction approach. Um, for more information about this study, uh, please check out this paper. Um, and uh, here I put a take home message here. Uh, I think it's very important, so I will read it. Um, so. Through this study, we do not indicate that fewer fires under the geoengineering approaches are definitely beneficial. Um, because fire is a natural process and a key component of our dynamic uh, system, and the wildfires were present long before anthropogenic activity. And uh, also, fire risk increase is only one of many possible consequences of climate change. And uh, fire activity reduction is also only one of many possible consequences of climate intervention. So uh, long story short, uh, more study, uh, studies are needed for this topic. And uh, this study here is only uh, serve as a reference. Uh, 
uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, we are coming to the last uh, topic of this um, presentation. So uh, I want to talk about a very special type of fire, uh, the wildland urban interface fire. So what is a wildland urban interface? It's a geographic area where anthropogenic urban land use and uh, wildland vegetation come into contact. The technical definition of uh, WI, uh, or sometimes people call it WUI, uh, the technical de definition of WUI um, can vary according to the purpose. But uh, here I listed uh, the, the one commonly used uh, in uh, North America. So why do we care about uh, fires in Wuyi? Here I listed a few reasons. Um, first, fire risk can be relatively high in Wuyi due to uh, human activity and human ignition. Um, and also Wuyi um, fires are closer to human and uh, properties. Therefore, they have a larger potential to cause damages and economic losses. And also fire emissions from Wuyi fires can be more harmful due to the um, possible involvement of a structure building and a vehicle burning. And lastly, it has been said that Wuyi fires will become even more important in the future. So uh, to look at the global trend of uh, Wuyi area, we, we developed a uh, uh, a uh, worldwide unified uh, wildland urban interface data set called uh, WUI um, using machine learning approach. Um, and uh, this data set was developed at a nine kilometer resolution for the whole globe for the past 20 years. Uh, and uh, this figure here shows the change from 2001 to 2020. As we can see, uh, uh, WUI area uh, has been increasing in all populated uh, continents. Um, and uh, how does the um, Wuyi fire look like? So here I'm showing the uh, fire fraction, fire count fraction in Wuyi on the left and the burned area fraction in Wuyi on the right. Uh, both fire count and burned area data are from uh, MODIS satellite. And I'm showing uh, different uh, years in different color. Uh, as we can see, globally speaking, the Wuyi fraction of both fire counts and uh, burn area have been increasing from 2005 to 2020. So uh, it's clear that both uh, Wuyi area and Wuyi fires have been um, increasing and becoming more um, important. And uh, then, uh, we also want to look at the uh, Wuyi fire impacts on air quality and the health uh, using, um, using the Musica model. So to do this, we run four Musica simulations uh, with different um, fire emission scenarios. There's no fire and uh, wildland fire only, Wuyi fire only, and all fires. Um, so by comparing these four uh, model simulations, we will be able to differentiate the impact of Wuyi fire versus wildland fire. Um, here I'm showing the uh, Wuyi fire impacts on a few uh, key air pollutants uh, on the surface, uh, CO2, PM2.5, and ozone. Uh, the top upper panel is the global look, and the bottom panel is zoomed in over continental United States. Um, so as we can see that Wuyi fires have a uh, notable impact on surface concentrations of uh, these key air pollutants. Um, and uh, now we, uh, we, we know it's impacting air quality, and uh, then we want to further look at its impact on health. Uh, so, uh, so we calculate the annual to total premature deaths attributable to PM2.5 and ozone exposure. Uh, by V, I uh, actually mean my collaborator Yao Xian and his student Dibatosh from Wayne State University. 
Uh, so they did all the calculation for this part. And if you have any questions, please ask, ask them, because I will not be able to answer. Um, but uh, here are some, uh, some details on how the calculation uh, was done. So for PM2.5, we calculated related APD due to uh, this uh, listed uh, disease. And for ozone, we quantify it uh, attributable for COPD. Um, and uh, let's look at the results. So uh, um, I, I want to bring your atten attention to this uh, bar plot. So the blue bar in this um, figure shows the relative contribution of UV fire to total fire emissions. And the pink bar um, is the uh, UV contribution to health impact. And uh, as we can see that um, the blue bar and the pink bar are very different, uh, meaning that the global health impact of UV fire emission is uh, disproportionately large compared to uh, wildland fires. And uh, this is uh, primarily because UV fires are closer to human settlement. And as we can see, the uh, Globally speaking, the, the health impact is three times larger than the emissions. Um, and uh, um, here is the take home message for this um, study. Okay. okay uh, I'm almost done. Uh, here is a summary of um, what I've talked about today. So I've talked about the research tools and the data I've been using in my uh, own study. That includes field campaign data, satellites, um, products, and global modeling. And we also covered these four topics um, for fire emissions, plume rise, diurnal variation, and the future fire projection under SSP and geoengineering scenarios and also the uh, UI fire. And uh, with that, I will stop here with uh, my favorite photo of uh, uh, wildfire smoke that was taken during fire execute field campaign from the NASA DC-8. Uh, this, uh, these are all fire smokes. And this is a shadow of the DC-8 aircraft sampling the uh, fire smoke. Yeah, thank you. For the nice presentation, questions for Van Fu? Oh, we have one we can take on the slide. How are FRP and burn fractions approaches compared? Yes, that's a good question. Um, I, I'd like to answer that with this uh, figure. Um, so in this paper, uh, in in this paper, we compared um, we compared the um, emissions of these uh, species from all these different um, inventory. So, Fin and uh, GFED are um, burned area based uh, approach, and uh, FIR and uh, GFED QFED are uh, FRP based approach. Um, I um, well the the FRP based approach is more um, you can make it more uh, near real time for operational use uh, be, uh, as a uh, burned area data they, there is a lag of the data availability um, but personally I like the burned area approach um, uh, because. Um, I do think, um, well, any, any, uh, every single uh, parameter in, in, in on this slide is subject to uncertainties. But uh, I think uh, this is uh, very challenging. Um, and this um, requires uh, some tuning to, to do. 
uh, but I do think uh, we, we should uh, look for uh, bond area and FRP uh, merged uh, or some sort of hybrid uh, uh, approach that might um, be very interesting to look at. So I was going to ask, um, this is a great presentation, by the way, amazing amount of work. Um, I was going to ask what you would consider in the fire emission calculations globally, where is the largest uncertainty? And it sort of sounds like you just pointed towards the biome-specific conversion factors, but would you want to comment on that any further? And I have another question, too. Yeah, uh, so when, when we evaluate FIN and uh, tested uh, uh, different parameters, we found that uh, biomass loading is uh, the, the, so the largest uh, source of uncertainty. Luisa can correct me. Yeah. In that case, yeah. We'll assume she won't. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so my other question was, if you go back to that, that plot you just showed from the paper, um, there is a big difference between FIN 1.5 and FIN 2.5. Can you comment on why that is such a huge difference and what has happened between those two versions? Yes, um, so FIN version one is uh, uh, only use MODIS uh, active fire detection and uh, FIN 2.5 use both MODIS and VIRS. And uh, that's uh, one of the major difference. And uh, there is an algorithm uh, in FIN version 2 that uh, is able to um, merge uh, file data from different satellites without uh, over counting, uh, double counting. And I think there's also other, um, ah. <laughs> there's also other updates that, yeah, there's also other updates uh, here in, in that abstract. Okay, um, maybe we go to the online question from Ronnie. Great presentation. Can CESM accurately simulate the impacts of geoengineering on fuel loading and in turn these impacts on fire? Yeah. Um, so um, the fire calculation relies on all the, uh, these um, factors. Um, the, uh, the wind speed, the relative humidity, soil moisture, and uh, um, these uh, um, uh, variables are, um, will be directly influenced by geoengineering uh, in the community atmosphere model. Uh, there, are, there will be uh, processes that's not accounted uh, in the simulation. Um, for example, the fire emissions, uh, we use um, uh, I, I think uh, 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 external fire emissions was used um, instead of uh, calcul the fire emissions calculated here. Therefore, that's, uh, that process is not accounted uh, in, in this study. That's just one example, and I'm sure there are other uh, processes that's not accounted. Uh, great talk, Wen Fu. Um, with the, the Wui firework, did you adjust emission factors for Wui influenced fires, or did you just use the standard land cover emissions factors? Yes, that's a great question that I'm hoping nobody would ask. <laughs> uh, no, uh, we, so we separate uh, Wui fire only by uh, location, and we didn't uh, account for the emission difference yet in this study. Uh, but uh, in future, we do hope to take that into account. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question online from Yan Jiang. Thanks, Ben Fu, for amazing words. Two quick questions. What are general causes of Wui fires, human activities? And second, wonder about wildland fire emissions in the musical simulations. How do we fire emissions compare to other fire emissions in the model? Oh, um, I I have a I have a figure that uh, very straightforwardly shows. Uh, um, I should have put that into my um, slides. Sorry. 
Um, so uh, in, in Wu Wei, uh, human ignition plays a very important role. Um, so the, um, ah, here. So uh, this figure shows uh, um, it's only for uh, uh, continental United States where data are more available. Um, so um, uh, the, the, the y-axis is basically the importance of, uh, relative importance of Wu Wei fire. And as we can see, uh, for all human ignited uh, um, fires, or Wu Wei uh, fire, uh, is a large, has a larger um, portion comparing to the lightning started fires. Uh, this is the case for for uh, continental United States. For other regions, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah. And the second question. Uh, so, we fire emissions account for. Uh, in terms of CO2, I think it's less than 5% um, of the total emissions. Yeah, less than 5%. Except in Europe. Yeah, because they, they have a lot of wooey area. Okay. Other questions in the room? Yeah, thanks, Wenfu. This is a great presentation. I have a follow-up question from uh, Ronnie's question, where you show, if I correctly uh, you remember, you have uh, RCP or SSP uh, scenarios of fire projection. I have remember, uh, maybe I could uh, remember wrong, that your 4.5 actually has lower burn area than 2.6. Can you explain a little bit? And then yes. also you hear it showing the, the next one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, on the left, you're showing the SSP 4.5 is lower than the 2.6. I, I, can you explain a little bit? And then here, you're only showing the burn area trend. Is it also possible to show like an emission trend for different four uh, scenarios? Yes. Um, so uh, this is the uh, emission trend together with the um, Burn area trend. Uh, emission trend. Emission is calculated based on burn area and uh, fuel uh, condition. So um, the the it, it's uh, slightly more complex than the burn area. Um, and uh, so for this, uh, I should put uh, this all in my slides. Um, yeah. So. Um, a different SSP scenarios, it will have different climate forcing, but also different uh, population and uh, GDP. And uh, those all impact uh, uh, the, the fire simulation uh, in these um, scenarios. And I think uh, um, the difference uh, between 2.6 and uh, 4.5, if I remember correctly, there's uh, one 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 scenario has uh, more. Uh, uh, I forgot deforestation or afforestation, uh, but uh, I will check. Uh, I will check and uh, let you know. That may be the cause. Okay. So we have a few more questions online. Masi is saying, "Nice talk. Have you looked at the impact of fuel moisture on emission factors?" Yes, that's a great question. Um, uh, we have not yet, but uh, we do um, hope to look at that. And uh, uh, we are writing a proposal to uh, to address the impact of um, uh, water vapor on uh, oh uh, on the fuel moisture. Oh, that's a, a great another great question. <laughs> um, uh, uh, well, we, we, we are planning to develop uh, emission inventory because um, uh, if you look at the um, current fire emission, in, ah, it's not here. Current fire emission inventory, none of them have uh, explicitly um, considered um, 
uh, the water vapor emission. But I think that's an important uh, component, and we do should uh, uh, we do need to add that to the picture. Um, but uh, no, we haven't looked at fuel moisture impacts. But uh, it will impact uh, uh, the combustion efficiency and also the um, ignition. Um, uh, the combustion efficiency uh, directly impact emission factors. I think it's uh, studied in some lab uh, experiments and also uh, uh, sampled uh, uh, in, in the field measurements. But uh, no, I haven't uh, do anything I in the model for that. So one last question from the room before I go to Maria's question online. Um, uh, thanks for a great talk. I just have it in this slide. So we can see like uh, burned air is, is super increasing in the uh, 8.5 scenarios. So this is just surface temperature or is there any other factors that impact on the burned area? Yeah. Um, so surface temperature is one uh, driving factor. Uh, there's other uh, wind speed and uh, relative humidity and uh, precipitation and uh, soil water content. Uh, surface temperature is one driving factor, but uh, if I remember correctly, it's not the, the most important driving factor. Uh, I think uh, it's relative humidity or um, uh, also relative humidity due to uh, tem surface temperature. Um, yeah. I think uh, it's, yeah, uh, surface temperature is one of the driving factors. Okay, thank you, Wenfu. So let's go to the last question online from Maria. Do you know if there is a relationship between the land fire fuels, for example, Anderson fuels, and the biomass profiles used to calculate emissions? I don't know. Uh, I'm not familiar with the, the data set, the uh, land fire fuel. Yeah, it, I think these and Anderson fuels are used like in the fire behavior models like war fire. Oh, but OK. That's good to know. Let me take a note. <laughs> You can do that <laughs> after the seminar. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, and maybe can get back to Maria. <laughs> All right, um, that was a great seminar, Wenfu. Let's thank Wenfu once more. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.